Welcome to my series on friendships and memories and fabrics. You may wonder, what is this series about? Well, think of it as recording special events like a graduation or wedding or artistically showcasing family genealogy with fabric. Our first project is a grapevine wreath memory block. Family names are pen stitched in the grapevines with the children's names in the leaves. There's room for future grandchildren's names to be added to the grape clusters. Discover the joy of stitching memories next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's how-to sewing program with Nancy Zeman is being brought to you by Pfaff, the largest European producer of sewing machines. Pfaff's creative line of sewing machines and hobby lock sergers are simply the best. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears for home, classroom, and industry. Ginger scissors and shears are the choice of professionals. Madeira thread from Germany with superior quality and smart packaging to make it a sensational value. Preferred by home and professional embroiderers everywhere. Oxmoor House, the publisher of innovative sewing, quilting, and craft books, including books by Nancy Zeman. Prim Dritz, the source for sewing and quilting notions, including products by Dritz, Collins, and Omnigrid. Amazing designs by Great Notions, your complete source for machine embroidery. Over 200 embroidery pack collections currently available, including designs by Nancy Zeman. And Nancy's Notions Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and unique, hard-to-find sewing notions and supplies. This is a very versatile project from a wall quilt to a bed quilt, any size that you'd like to commemorate your family in many blocks or just one. Designed by Kate Brzezinski, we have four fabrics, one yard of the cream and three-eighths of a yard of the other three colors. As always, in the booklet that accompanies the series, we give the dimensions and the sizes to cut everything. I would recommend that you cut the strips for the borders and the bindings and the sashings before cutting the appliques. That will make it so much easier to know what fabric you have left over. So there are various different widths to cut, and you could add different colorations if you'd like, but we cut various sizes. Cut those out prior to doing any of the other applique work. The big fabric, which was one yard fabric of the cream, cut into one 18 inch square for the center block. And here we have an 18 inch square, and underneath it you'll find that I have a tissue paper found the center of the tissue paper and then drew a circle, 10 inches. And you can use your favorite technique of working with a circle. We used a yardstick compass set at 5 inches and then just drew that circle in the center. This is to give a placement for the wreath area. Now you can use the transfer of this using a window, a light table of your choice, and I'm going to use a light table right now, just placing the paper down first of all and then centering the 18 inch square fabric over the light table. You can use a window, tape this to your window on a sunny day. You can have quite a few choices that you'd like. And then using a fabric marking pencil or pen, just kind of do a dotted line around the area just to give you an indication of where you're going to be placing the grapevines. And there we go. We have just little dots. That's all we need. The next step will be to work with the appliques, and we, we trace these from the booklet, the shapes of the grape vines as well as the leaves and the grape clusters. I'm going to use the traditional paperback fusible web and trace numerous sections. Now I have a very small piece of webbing here, but I think you can get the idea you'd be tracing quite a few. Now this design is kind of nice because this grapevine cluster has three vines that are nested together making it easy and quickly to cut. So we, this one unit makes a whole grouping. And the good thing about a grapevine is that it's not even, and if you can see I'm not following this exactly, and that will be all right. Then after roughly cutting out the shape of each of your sections, fuse it to the wrong side of some paper, or wrong side of some fabric, excuse me, and then start to cut from the lines that you drew. And you can see here are three grape cluster or three grape vines that are being cut out of one shape. You would do the same idea for the leaves and for the grape clusters, and I'll show you on our fabric how the layout is starting to take place. Using the marking on your fabric, position the grape vines, and then of course you could position 
the leaves and clusters, peeling off after trimming the paperback fusible web and positioning these elements, making it symmetrical, asymmetrical, however you'd like to position it, and then fused to put everything in place. This is something that you're going to create for your family or for friends, however you'd like to work with it, so you don't have to have it just the way we positioned it for this first wall hanging. Here's a linear design. Isn't this kind of nice? Great for a banner. I love this one for a heart shape, perhaps for an anniversary, a wedding gift, and then another semicircle. So you can see there are many positions for this grapevine memory block. I'm ready now to go over the steps of satin stitching around the appliques. I've chosen three colors of rayon thread to do the stitching around the great vines, the leaves, and the clusters. Since it's rayon thread, I'm going to be using an embroidery needle suitable for the rayon thread. In the bobbin, you can use a bobbin fill thread, lightweight. The key is to have it lightweight so it's not going to add bulk to your stitching, or you can find those pre-wound bobbins that work in most machines. To allow the stitch to be as attractive as possible, you loosen the top tension by two numbers or two notches. That will keep the bobbin thread underneath where it should be for a satin stitching. I have my, set my machine for a zigzag satin stitch. You may have a specialty stitch set for your machine or just a plain zigzag, but then do a test sample. I am using a more contrasting thread so you can see the distance or difference here. I started with a wider width, a 3.5 width and a 1.5 length, but decided that this smaller width is more attractive and easier to maneuver around all these shapes that I have in the design. You'll see I have a stabilizer, a tearaway stabilizer in the back, just a little scrap. You would back your fabric with a tearaway stabilizer or a stabilizer that presses on for a temporary aid. This one has a wax backing that fuses to the underside just temporarily, long enough for you to do the stitching and then you carefully remove it. The open toe foot is in my machine right now and I really find that this is a, a nice foot to use because there's more opening. I can see what I'm doing for my stitching a little bit more readily. We're going to stitch with the when the right needle is ending just on the outside of the fabric and I'm going to stop with the needle as I get to this outside corner with the needle on the outside of my design then I can raise the presser bar and pivot. The key is not to have too tight of a stitch because that's a little bit harder to maneuver. So do test, if you haven't worked with applique for a while, test one of your appliques on your scrap of fabric as well. So I'm again at the outside of the design. My needle is in the outside position. If you had an inside corner, you guessed it, you stop with a needle on the inside and pivot. Now I'm going to do an inside curve. The curves are a little bit more challenging than maybe the corners because you sew slowly and with your hands kind of move the fabric to maneuver that curve. If you need to pivot, which I'm going to do right here, I'm going to stop with the needle in the fabric in the outside position, slightly move it, and then work my way around that curve. A mistake that many people make, especially first-time appliqueers, is to use a wide zigzag. Actually, the wider width showcases your stitching a little bit more, and if you're not just exactly accurate, it will make it work, look a little bit too outstanding. Now I'm again at an outside corner, and I'm just going to, to stitch, and it really goes quite fast. And I'm another outside corner, and I'll just keep going. So you can see this is kind of a fun treatment. I've used more contrasting thread here than I would normally work with, but that way you can see the stitching. So you can applique around all the edges, and if you'd like, at this point it might be a good idea to have the names put in the quilt. On our quilt you can see we have Melissa and Maggie and uh, Amanda already printed in with a pen stitch, with a fabric marking pen. The next step would be to add the borders, and you can see this has already been quilted, but I'm going to show you how to do the quilting technique. You can definitely use a variety of borders or bindings, and we'll show you a couple of those options in just a little bit. And also, during my break, I'll set up my machine for free motion quilting. I have another quilt top to show you that features five clusters of grapes in an asymmetrical design. Notice as well that the quilt block is point on point rather than square within the wall hanging. This is a nice, interesting design. We've layered the the top quilt area with a batting and a backing. 
and you can see the pins throughout the design holding it in place. We're going to be echo stitching, sewing around the appliques with free motion technique, but in the unappliqued areas, we're going to echo again around grapevine, grapevines and leaves, but this time stitching over paper. Rather than stitching the exact applique, we've traced on paper, pattern paper, the applique shapes, and then I'm going to free motion stitch around these designs as a quilting option. I'm going to peel this back and sew on this in just a few minutes, but to show you as well the finished quilt that we worked with earlier. You can see that we have little stitchings around this area, how nicely it is quilted. But to get the tracings, the designs that are going to go in the borders, in the unstitched areas, to get those positioned, you just simply find the center of the design, mark it on the paper, and then draw your asymmetrical or symmetrical arrangement on this area. You could use pins or a pattern paper spray temporary adhesive spray to position it and hold it in place while you're doing the quilting. The choice is yours. Obviously this is finished, but that's just showing you how the positioning of the quilting took place. And then you could see, as after we've done the quilting, you can see how the shadow look repeats the design of the grapes, the leaves, and the vines. The machine is set up now for machine quilting, free motion quilting. I put a darning foot on my machine or you could purchase a separate darning foot. It rides above the fabric and allowing you to move the fabric with your hands rather than with the feed dogs. Speaking of feed dogs, you're going to drop them, lower or cover them. I have cotton fabric, cotton thread I should say, a fine grade of cotton thread in the needle and a lightweight thread in the bobbin or you could use clear thread. Use the appropriate needle with your thread. The same type of bobbin thread would work great for this type of sewing the type of bobbin thread we used earlier. A straight stitch is what I have on my machine and I'm ready to do the stitching. The key is that you're not going to be having feed dogs on your machine and I'm going to find a section that I'll do some stitching. There we go. And I'm going to echo stitch, stitch around the leaf. Stitching a little bit out further than just exactly following the satin stitch, with my hands I'm going to be moving the fabric this will give a puffy look to the design because the leaves will be accentuated by the stitching. And just keep sewing around the edges. You don't have to be perfectly accurate because, of course, this is just a, a fun quilting area. Let me cut out this extra thread. We don't want to have that in place. There we go. And keep stitching. So you go around all these areas just highlighting it. The faster you sew and the slower you move the fabric, the easier it will be, believe it or not. If you want some tendrils like there are on traditional grape line, vines, just simply make a few curly cues. Now I'm going to go over to the paper area and show you, you can use the same technique. Instead of following the applique, you follow the design on the paper. Now no one's going to know the exact shape of the design, so if you go outside the edges, the paper later will be torn away and it will look just perfect. Notice I'm not matching things just right. I'm going to make another tendril, kind of go into the border, and then show you when I lift this up how to tear away the paper. And you can see what's underneath. Kind of hold your thumb or fingers next to the stitching line and tear and this tears away quite easily. If you didn't get it all torn away, just help yourself out a little bit with the tweezers. And as I'm working away, you can see how easy it is to get the personalization added to this great quilt block. Our next project is a perfect example of friendships in fabric. It's called Morning Glory Memories. Create this easy to sew centerpiece for a wedding anniversary, bridal shower, or going away party. Have the guests sign a flower or leaf for a lasting memory. I'd like you to take a close-up look of this centerpiece again so that you can see where we've started to sign this for our friend Sarah, who will be soon married. We need some other of our co-workers to sign this, but it is a great way of keeping memories in, in fabric, as this whole series is about. This is a perfect project to create together. This should not be done by one person, but a group of people. Sewers and non-sewers alike can work with this because primarily this is a no-sew project, working with fabric. 
You'll need a yard of fabric for the centerpiece fabric, the large peach color that I have here, and then about an eighth of a yard of fabrics in five different colors, and we've chosen pastel colors, real pretty light colors, like morning glories. You're going to again make a circle, this time a larger circle than we made for our last project of this program, setting the distance between the compass points by 15 inches so that you'll get a 30 inch paper circle. On the paper, after you've created the 30 inch circle, fold the paper in half once, fold it in half twice, and then a second time. And the pie now is in eighths, and each eighth is going to have a morning glory motif, and that's what you'll get in the booklet that accompanies the program. We need to have mirror images of this motif, so on the pieces of paper I've drawn one image the way it appears and then flipped the paper and drew a second motif because we're going to be placing one motif within each area of this paper. Now I'm going to put the large paper on my highlighting table. I'm just going to be working with smaller samples, not whole tablecloths, so it's going to look a little odd. But that way I'm not using a lot of fabric that I'm or wasting a lot of fabric. You place the paper on your light table or your window, your fabric over this area, and notice that I've traced the motif about one inch from the edge so it doesn't go to the very edge, and then draw the design, drawing slightly within the shaping. Just finish drawing all the elements that you see coming through the light, all the vine shapes, all the way around the outer edge of the cloth. And on this small sample, I have two of the motifs drawn. And for a no-sew technique, have a friend draw in the vines. And you can use a jelly roll pen, a fabric marking pen, just fill in the vine shapes. That's quite quick to do. And just highlight these, maybe going over it a couple of times. Or if you'd like, you could also do some stitching. This is to get a satin stitch in the vine area and we have to get a raised effect stitched over a cord or pearl crown rayon thread. And here you can see it's just a satin stitch, a tight satin stitch going over this cord to give it the raised look. So you can use the no-sew look or the little textured look if you'd like. Now for the appliques, using the same technique that we went over earlier, using the paperback fusible web, create appliques. There are lots of them. You may want to do one quadrant at a time, one section at a time. But this time, you're going to use the no sew paperback fusible web. It generally has a darker line marked through the paper side of it. You cut, fuse it, cut it, the same techniques that we worked with earlier, and then pe peeling off the paper backing. It's a stickier web or a more durable web that you can simply position along the marking lines. Now you'll have to do all the tracing that we did before. Let's find this going the right direction. You can see why you want to do all quadrant, one quadrant at a time because there are many different shapes and sizes. And then fuse into place. After fusing all this, you don't have to sew because it is a no-sew type of application. You can finish the edge with your favorite technique. And we're using bias tape. We made bias tape with, a, with using the sample fabric or the base fabric stitched around the edge. After stitching, then we did a clipping about every inch or so because this is a curve to make it no-sew. We put again some of that paperback fusible web, the heavy type, wrapped it around the cut edge to the wrong side and press. And then the edge is finished for a great fast finish. One of the key elements to make lasting memories in fabrics is to choose the right pen to sign your works of art. Micron pens, jelly roll pens are perfect ways to add memories to your quilt or to your wall hanging. I hope you'll give it a try. Here's a hint from Adira. Adding a layer of stabilizer to the top or bottom of a project is an important step, giving extra stability to the fabric. For most of my projects, I prefer Avalon by Madeira. This water-soluble stabilizer has double the strength of comparable stabilizers. I simply place the Avalon underneath the fabric, giving the fabric some general stability. If working with nap fabrics like fleece or corduroy, to keep the threads from embedding into the nap, 
place the Avalon on top and underneath the fabric. When finished, just simply tear away the majority of the stabilizer and spritz the rest away. Here's a hint from Pfaff. For the most accurate of top and edge stitching, use Pfaff's ability to change the needle positions. There are a total of 19 positions ranging from far left to far right, plus many more positions in between. I use the needle position option frequently when using the edge stitch foot. The stitching can be positioned just at your preference. I also use the needle position option when top stitching a zipper. I know you'll find many more uses. Next, a hint from Oxmoor House. The book, Essential Sewing Guide, is a how-to book, but also a reference book. We often hear from readers that they use the many charts, including the needle and feed charts, on a frequent basis. In fact, one reader, Barbara Schaefer, from Chicago, tapes samples next to the feed chart, along with noting machine settings. She writes, my book is thick in spots, and I suppose odd-shaped, yet this personalization makes this book truly an essential guide for me. During this program on Sewing with Nancy, I'll present the second program of my series on friendships and memories in fabric. We'll take a fresh look at family trees, complete with fabric branches and thread leaves. Before stitching the more traditional family tree, create our version of a fabric feather tree. Like the old-fashioned Christmas feather trees, our tree has the characteristic sparse branches, leaving plenty of room for your guests to sign in to create a lasting heirloom. That's what's next on Sewing with Nancy. This project in Memories and Fabric is created with a little bit of fabric, three-fourths of a yard of cream fabric and a fourth of a yard of burgundy. Designed by Donna Fenske, it's made, as I mentioned earlier, to resemble the old-fashioned feather tree. But you can sign, as Donna has had her family this past season, sign in pine shapes or pine needle shapes across the branches. And each year she'll add a few more signatures. It's kind of a fun look. The sewing is extremely simple working with easy techniques and I'll show you how to go through the process of putting it together. As I mentioned, you'll need three-fourths of a yard of fabric of the cream color. Cut a section from it that's 14 and a half inches wide and 18 and a half inches long. Press, make a finger press or using an iron, find the center of the fabric because that's where we're going to place the trunk of the tree. Just a light press is all we need here. And when I open this up, you'll see the press mark in this section. And the light press mark is what we have. We've used bias tape, brown bias tape, as well as green bias tape for the components of the tree. We use the purchased tape that was already made. You could make your own if you'd like. It has the fusible web already fused to the underside. Matching the lower edge, I'm going to pin that for you, and then guiding this strip along the press mark is how you're going to position it. The fusible web on the underside is there just for a temporary hold. You're not going to get by without doing a little bit of sewing, but this will position it. Now, if, if I wasn't exactly straight, I could peel it off, reposition it, and then again press. So you can see how simple that is. That's 16 inches. Then for the green, you'll need a yard and a half of green fourth of an inch tape. Starting with a three inch strip, I'll peel off the paper backing, find the center of it, and just kind of finger press the center. These quick little pressings work easily. And I'm going to align the tape measure just to give me a guide. And pin that down. I'm going to start by placing this two inches down, and I'll just press a half a side at a time so that I can use my tape measure. Then the five inch strip, and I think you get the general idea of how this works. Measuring again, two inches down. I put it at five inches there. There we have it at two inches. And you keep positioning your strips as you go along. Another two inches at the six inch mark, I would place two. This is three inches, five inches. Now we're going to go to the seven inch. And this one got a little crooked, so I'll simply lift up the tape and get it straight. So I'm just going to do these first three branches of my feather tree. The stitching can be accomplished with a double needle or with just one needle. And here's another design that Donna created. We'll reposition that trunk down. 
instead of having the feather tree look, she made it more of a pine tree. This is kind of nice as well. But simply use a double needle, three millimeters wide, and stitch down the trunk, or stitch with a single needle stitching two times. Matching thread or clear thread, whatever your preference may be. Simple so far, extremely simple. The next step is to work with the fabric. The fabric to make the candy cane borders, as you saw in our earlier project. And I'll just refer to this earlier project that you saw, the finished one. Each of these strips, or these little squares, are about two, two inches wide. But we're going to, rather than cutting triangles, or excuse me, squares, we're going to cut strips of fabric. And for cutting these strips of fabric, we're going to cut them with a rotary cutter. And I'll get this position for you. Sewing with a fourth of an inch seam allowance. Meet right sides together. Sew with a fourth of an inch seam allowance. And press the seams to the darker side. Then I'm just going to stack these one on top of the other. So as I'm cutting, I'll cut two at the same time, matching these cut edges. And here we go. We'll cut a clean edge at first. I always like to get a clean, sharp edge. And then I cut two and a half inch strips to begin with. So now I'll line everything up and cut, subcut as it's called, two and a half inches again. And keep cutting away. Very, very simple sewing and laying out of these subcuts. Now we'll divide these and I'll show you how you arrange the strips around the fabric. Have these nicely laid out. Here we're going to be working with fabrics. We'll be using three subcuts across the top plus an extra square, just one square. And then along the side, we'll be having, again, subcuts, this time five of them. Five cuts are going to go down the area. When these are sewn together, the length will be correct because we're I'm not allowing for the fourth of an inch seam allowance, and you'll need one extra block. So first you sew the top blocks into place, and then after sewing the top blocks, then you will be sewing the side blocks. You can see how quickly that goes together. We'll refer back to our finished memory-making fabric quilt, and the last step is to look at buttons. Donna chose really fun buttons to accent this old-fashioned looking tree, and you can simply position these buttons into place, and I'm just going to put one here. This is, we'll sh I'll show you in a sample in a minute how to sew this on, but I'd like to sew it on with tape. That's not permanent, that's for positioning. Instead of sewing all these on by hand, here you can see that at the machine, I'm using a bar tack setting on my sewing machine and simply sewing all the buttons in around the area. And it's a quick, fast process. Go from button to button. Now you can layer all the fabrics and add the binding. And we've done that in the other programs on Sewing with Nancy. And you have a great memory tree for Christmas and the holiday season. You'll find yourself thinking back to fond memories when creating a family tree pillow. The stylized tree can easily showcase your family, large or small, plus allow room for new family buds. Choose two coordinating fabrics and gather family names and dates. You'll soon be on your way to preserving memories in fabric. As you just saw a close-up of this pillow, it is easy to put family names in, add some extra decorative stitching, and to make this pillow, you need two cuts of fabric, a half a yard each of a taupe color and a cream color. That's the colors we chose. We're going to do some stitching a little bit later, but first I'd like to show you how to make pil a pillow, really two pillows at once. Out of the taupe color, cut one 18-inch square, and out of the cream, cut two 18-inch squares. The rest of the fabric that you have for the taupe can be used for the backing of one pillow. This is a paperback fusible web, which we've used on many programs to making of appliques. And this is cut 17 inches square. The reason that's cut this way is because it's only 17 inches wide. And then trace the tree design from the booklet that accompanies this program. You'll get this design in the booklet. Make certain that you put the center line that's marked on the tree, trace that right onto your fabric. You can use a sunny, on a sunny day, you could use a window or you could use a light tracer 
or a light box, whatever you'd like, but trace the tree design on the paperback fusible web. I have placed or I've marked the center crease and I'm aligning that with the center of the tree design and take a little time to trace over the lines. Now I'm not going to trace the entire tree but you get the idea of how you're going to be tracing this. So just trace the entire tree. Since this is a paperback fusible web, we can simply put this on the back of the fabric. We're going to put this on the wrong side of the taupe color, center the fabric or the design over the fabric and press, firmly press. I've taken the liberty of already cutting this out, but here's a hint. Cut only on the lines. Do not cut at all into the margins or into the fabric because you get two for the price of one. If you cut it out exactly, you have one tree and then you have the reverse image of the tree. That's why you can make two pillows at one time. Perfect for a family because perhaps you may want to give one to your brother and another one to your sister or your parents, but there's usually more than one member to the family. So this is a great way of getting two gifts for yourself. Now you can peel off the paper backing of both of these elements, and I'm just going to do it to the tree right now, and then fuse into place. And again, I have pressed in, and possibly you can see that press mark on the fabric, noting the center so I can get this aligned and right in the center position. This is such a graceful tree pattern designed by Donna Fenske, and I think you'll just see by itself it's really attractive. Press into place. Now it's time to do some marking on the fabric. You can add your family names. Now I like to save this paper because if you save the paper you can practice writing what size and this is just a rough practice but we started determining where to put the lines or where to put the dates and just practice on this sheet before you actually work on the fabric and we have several fam family trees in process right here using a pen that's made for fabric mark dates names and the branches you could put the dates of the marriage, you can put the dates of the birth. The choice is yours. This is your family tree, so custom make it the way you'd like it. Now the next step is to do some zigzag stitching, and I'll show you this right now. There are two stitching steps. The first one is barely visible. We're going to be using a very narrow zigzag stitch, clear thread, and a metafill needle to stitch around the edges of the tree so that the two are attached together. The bonding is just kind of a temporary hold. I'm going to have that set up in my machine right now, a zigzag stitch, a one width, and a one length. I placed a stabilizer underneath my fabric so that I will not have, that will stabilize the fabric, and I'm going to zigzag over this area. Now I'm going to be using contrasting thread so that you can see it a little bit more clearly, but you would use the clear thread, which is very difficult to see. So right now we're just going to zigzag the edges. It takes a little bit of time, but it goes faster than perhaps if you were using a satin stitch because the stitches are not that close together. So just as you can see, just zigzag around the edges. When I pull this up, you can see how close the stitching will be to the edge, just a very fine finish. The next step is more decorative, and this is where you can add more branches. You can add room for grandchildren if you'd like with stitching of the branches, or leaves, I should say, onto the branches, but do a test first of all. On this scrap of fabric, I've added some stabilizer as well and tested out three of the decorative leaf stitches that I have in my machine. Now the interesting thing about this is that when I stitch from the top and I mark the top down, notice that the two outer edge leaf designs stitch from the top down and the middle one of course is upside down. You have to take that into consideration when planning the position of the leaves on your design. Ask me how I know this because I had to take out stitching where I had the leaves going in the wrong direction. So just keep that little statement in mind that test on the scraps so you know which way they stitch out. Choose a ran thread and I'm working with the green thread. Then I've changed the needle. We used a metafill needle with the monofilament thread. Now I use a machine embroidery needle. The right needle and the right thread is a great combination. It will save a lot of frustration, perhaps a breaking of threads. In the bobbin, I have a lightweight bobbin thread that I use for machine embroidery. And now I will slightly loosen the tension by two notches or two numbers. 
I have, again, the stabilizer on the fabric, and then the foot I've just put on my machine's embroidery foot. So I'm ready to do some stitching. Now, since the design I'm going to choose, in my design, I'm going to use one of those outer designs where the leaves stitch from the top down, I'm going to show you how I kind of meander or do the stitching. Just kind of starting out where I'd like these leaves to be. Now, rather than having a linear design, the way that the sample stitched out, after you stitch one or two leaves, stop with the needle in the down position, and then pivot, moving the presser foot so that you get an angle or a curve to the leaves, the leaves, the extra branches. You can find kind of as you go along that maybe you can kind of tilt it without actually having to stop and pivot. And now I'm going to try to stop this one right at the branch, so I'm not going to go into the name. I'll just kind of anchor my stitch a little bit, and you can get the idea of how the stitching is accomplished. You will find that as you add branches, you can curve them all the way down. And here's the branch that we added, the extra little leaf. And you can see it's not that straight line. It looks more natural just because I did some pivoting. You're going to be adding lots of branches. And the addition of, or the benefit of adding branches is that you can, as I said earlier, save room for extra buds of your family, little extra ma family members. My brother Dean and his wife Marianne have four children, so I added four extra branches to Dean's branch and put their children's names in, this er in these areas. Of course, if there are some more family members that are added to our family tree, we can simply pen those in a little bit later. The finishing details, we simply added a piping along the outer edge, used the background fabric, the taupe fabric for the back of the pillow, and within a few hours of sewing and, and of hours of enjoyment, we have a great family tree preserved on a pillow. Every family has a different story to tell. Our family fabric tree design can relate to practically every story. Lois and Dennis Levenhagen blended their families together on November 22, 1980. Since they had a winter wedding, we chose fabrics that portrayed a winter scene and opted not to add leaves. Learn how to create a fuse-only family remembrance. This portion of the program will be more of a show and tell because you will make your fabric tree according to your family needs. You saw a close-up of this design where later on we could add more names to these family trees as the grandchildren arrive. When working with this, and this since this is a fuse-only design, rather than using the paperback fusible web that you can stitch through, choose the fuse-only webbing. It's heavier weight and it will have a red line. This line I did not add. It was on the yardage to denote the heavier weight of webbing. You shouldn't sew through it. So we cut out of two 18-inch squares, two different leaves, or I should say two different trees, and placed it onto a background. Again, purchased a half of a yard of the background fabric, blended the branches together, fused down, and then pen in, again, the families and the dates according to your wishes. Another idea that we have, kind of a creative idea, is to make the family trees as a wall hanging. We opted not to add the names on this one, making it more of a contemporary wall hanging, using three-fourths of a yard of two fabrics. The reason for the additional yardage is for to add three-inch borders around the edge and the binding. This is really very attractive. Donna Fenske, who designed the tree, made this wall hanging, and it really is attractive and could be used in many homes. I hope you'll make one of these fabric trees for your home. In this program of Friendships and Memories and Fabrics, we created two tree designs, one the feather tree and of course the family tree pillow. Keep in mind, as always, we include the patterns and all the instructions for these ideas in the booklet that accompanies today's program. Here's a hint from Primdritz, the manufacturers of OmniGrid rulers. These precision laser-cut rulers give unmatched accuracy. They're made of heavy-duty clear acrylic and are perfect for rotary cutting any color fabric from light to dark. OmniGrid's exclusive double sight lines are printed on the underside of the ruler for greatest accuracy in contrasting black and yellow, enabling you to see the measurements you need. Notice the ease of measuring on this pink fabric as well as a dark print. In addition to the straight cutting lines, you'll find degree lines 60, 45, and 30, allowing you to cut geometric shapes without the use of templates. I think you can see why I use OmniGrid rulers on TV and at home. 
Here's a hint from Ginger. When you're doing machine embroidery or cut work, it's sometimes a challenge to trim threads and fabric from the hoop fabric. I keep my curved embroidery scissors close by for just those occasions. The curved blade cleanly cuts threads close to my work without cutting my stitching, and the slender blades allow me to cut right next to my straight stitch cut work design. Another terrific use of the curved embroidery scissors is to trim closely to scallop stitching. This is a very versatile scissors. Here's a hint from Amazing Designs by Great Notions. When looking for a background for your embroidery, consider iron-on transfers. Iron-on transfers from the Amazing Designs embroidery scape line eliminate the search for the perfect fabric. The iron-on transfers act as a backdrop and let you add the detail with your embroidery. I've created this garden scene with two iron-on transfers, the tree and the cottage, while the embroidery is from the Memories of Home embroidery card. The bird bath, trellis, and inviting garden chairs complete this garden scene. Welcome to Sewing with Nancy. In this program, I will continue creating friendships and memories in fabric. Let's start by taking a look back to see how women of the early 1900s preserved memories and created fiber art. This crazy piece quilt was made by my great-grandmother, Alice Lee Larson, who lived in a Norwegian settled farming village in Larson, Wisconsin. She was adept at the needle arts and had the foresight to date her quilt. Using her quilt as inspiration, I'd like to share with you the joy of crazy quilting next on Sewing with Nancy. My great-grandmother's quilt was the inspiration for this program of our series. I've had this quilt stuffed away in a corner of a closet for years, about 20 years, because it did not have a backing, it did not have binding, all those had worn off. My great aunt Viola restored part of her mother's work by putting patches over the worn area. This was a prom dress, and you can see that there's some green velvet right there that she patched on that area, and she just kind of helped me out, then gave this to me. Well, I recently remembered that I had it and decided to restore it. My staff and I helped me add backing. We used wool backing, and then I did a little hand stitching, crewel work around the edges to tie in with all of this beautiful crewel work. Notice the date. The date is very prominent on this quilt, and then the beautiful handwork that she was able to work with. Now she created this quilt on rectangles, rectangles of, of old linen fabrics. We were able to videotape this quilt before we restored it. Here you can see that quilt. On the back of the quilt, when we look, lift it up, you can see squares or rectangles of fabric. And she utilized every piece of fabric she had, whether it was pretty or not. The unpretty fabric went to the underside and used as a foundation. I'm going to show you how to work with this. But before doing this, let's just take another look at this restored quilt, and you can kind of see the blocks. I'm going to kind of guide them out for you. Here is a block that it was stitched together. Here is a seam, and here's another block. So she put this together in block formation, working on small mini quilts. And this is a large quilt, a small mini quilt to make one big quilt. Well, we use Grandma, Great Grandma Larson's technique to create a pillow. And here's the pillow. For those of us who sew and quilt, our scrap boxes are unorganized sources of potential projects, as well as memories. A velvet scrap may jog memories of a prom. A calico print can recall your child tugging at the quilt you made, or a certain plaid may bring back thoughts of a first day of school dress. Rather than keeping those remnants tucked away, give them a new life as a quilt or a pillow. You just saw a close-up of the pillow I made. It is a far cry from great-grandmother's quilt, but it gives the idea of how to work with this technique. Rather than hand stitching, we're going to do some machine stitching, decorative stitches, as well as using embroidery cards to add some in interest. Old buttons could also be used. This is going to be worked on a foundation, much of the same way that sewers and quilters in the early 1900s worked on their quilts, on their memory quilts. We have a small little foundation here. The pillow actually was 18 inches, or is 18 inches. It had a foundation. I started with 20 inches, made it a little bit, bit larger, and then squared it to the finished size later. Go through your scraps and find scraps that you'd like to use. Weight doesn't matter. I have a bo boiled wool. Here's a wool piece, a rayon, a couple other rayons, and another wool weights that do not normally coordinate together, but in a crazy piecing, anything goes. 
start with a scrap of fabric that has been pressed and place it in the center of your foundation or background fabric. You can pin it into place or you can simply stitch around the edges. I've just pinned it right now and now I'd like to show you how to add the rest of the fabrics. The basic concept of crazy piecing hasn't changed from the 20th century. In the 21st century, we're going to do the same concept. Work with the background fabric. I've based it around the edges this time. And then cut your scraps into usable pieces. It doesn't have to have any rhyme or reason, the shape and size of the piece. Just align with right sides together one of the edges. And then I'm going to stitch. Now stitching can be done with just a straight stitch. And I'm going to align the edge of my presser foot and sew the two together. You don't have to have a consistent seam because we're going to cover those seam allowances up as we go along. You can use an extra thread that you may have because perhaps it's not even going to show. Then you can fold the fabric to the outside and give it a press. Now the next piece that I'm going to add is going, not going to have a very straight edge to follow. For example, you can see this kind of angular seam. Well, rather than trying to follow that, we'll just meet right sides together and place a strip of fabric across that edge and straighten out the seam as we sew. Kind of lay this on top. You may find places where one seam allowance may start out at half of an inch and then it may go down to maybe a fourth of an inch or less. It really doesn't matter. It's not going to show. It will all be covered up and the anchor cloth or the foundation fabric will serve as the grain line and it will go together very easily. Then I'll simply fold this to the right side, this being that third piece of fabric, and give it a quick press. If you can have your iron next to your sewing surface, it will work out so very well. You may also want to keep a sharp, sharp scissors, your rotary cutter, and a mat to speed the process along. This is called crazy quilting or piecing because sometimes you may think you're going crazy because you may have an edge that's not matching. For example, on this sample shows an angled corner. Rather than trying to straighten this out and losing a lot of the other fabric that has been stitched, I'm just going to align this piece with the red section and stitch a small seam and tuck under the other portion of this piece of fabric. There are no rules, as I stated earlier. You just kind of make them up as you go along. We'll have to do some trimming of this fabric, but let me show you what happens as I press this to, finger press this to the right side. Now I'm simply just going to tuck under the section to meet it to the taupe color that's underneath, and I'll tuck it a little bit more. Oh, one more time. Here, we'll tuck that, we'll have to trim that lower layer and you can see this edge then would be st stitched down with a decorative stitch, which I'm going to show you next. After covering all the foundation fabrics, then you can do decorative stitching. My great-grandmother did it by hand. We're going to use the decorative stitches on the sewing machine. Do a test. Test on another scrap of fabric, making certain that you have the right stitch length. Because of the bulk of the seams, you may want to lengthen these stitches just a touch. I'm going to set my machine for a feather stitch. I've twisted this out already, and I'm going to stitch this feather stitch right here on this taupe section. I have rayon embroidery thread in my machine. I've chosen to stitch this a red and black to change off as I'm stitching. I have a machine embroidery needle. I've loosened my tension by two numbers or two notches and I have lightweight bobbin thread in the bobbin and I'm sewing. I don't have a stabilizer. And you may wonder why I don't. Well, keep in mind that I have that background fabric. Now, as I pull this up, you can see that I have just a little touch of that decorative stitch right in here. And I could add decorative stitches all the way around. Let me show you some of the other options that I worked with. I have used red thread in this section you can see a leaf pattern and also some machine embroidery and that's what I'll show you next. It's easy to add a very contemporary element to your crazy piecing with machine embroidery using a card or a disc and I've chosen some wrought iron designs to place in my pillow and you can see that I've stitched some designs out and I think they'll look great with the taupe gray and the black and red that I have chosen for my pillow. 
So I'm going to place these on the fabric. You can do it in one of two ways. You can add the stitching before doing the quilting, before adding the strips to the base fabric. And this is what this sample shows. Since I had a scrap of fabric and it was not large enough to fit into the hoop, I basted it to the stabilizer, placed the stabilizer on the hoop, added the machine embroidery, removed the stabilizer and added as a strip. But sometimes I don't always plan ahead. And in this instance, when I made the pillow, I didn't. I added the embroidery after the fact. So I'm gonna show you that process as well. Using one of the templates that I stitched out just to practice. I'm going to position it just that I'd like the middle of the design right at this hash mark and you can see that I've made this cross mark beforehand. I can fold the fabric along the vertical mark and I have a pin at the horizontal mark so I can fold it in force. You may wonder why are you doing this? Well this is just for positioning so I can place this in the hoop. I'm not going to put it in the hoop per se, not in between the hoops but on top of it. I have a sticky back stabilizer that we've used a lot on Sewing with Nancy. It has a sticky surface, scored the fabric, or the paper I should say, to expose the sticky surface and then align with the marks on the hoop, the horizontal and little vertical notches on the hoop, position the fabric. And I'm going to lay this down flat so that I can get it aligned and finger press, just finger press it in place. I've set up my machine for machine embroidery, put on the embroidery attachment, I've rayon thread in the machine, I've lowered the feed dogs, I have lightweight thread in the bobbin, and I'm just about starting right in the center of my design. I've made sure that I have the feed dogs dropped, I'll clip the threads, and just let it stitch. And I can stitch my design without having the fabric in the hoop. You can see with all these seams it would be almost impossible to do that. So I'll just let the machine stitch and show you that this pillow is so versatile. After doing all the stitching, trim it to size, add your favorite binding and backing, and enjoy the memories. Commemorate graduations and anniversaries by combining photos, fabrics, and threads. Donna Fenske, who designs many of the Sewing with Nancy projects, created this memory-filled wall quilt for her daughter Jessica in celebration of her high school graduation. You can't help but be drawn to the cute snapshots that have been transferred to fabric and the spring floral machine embroidery designs that represent a bright future. Here's how to combine photos, fabrics, and threads. We're going to use the same crazy piecing element that we used earlier in today's program, but change it by adding photos. We have on Sewing with Nancy done photo transfers many times, Color, or transferring the photos to paper, photo transfer paper, and then pressing to fabric. This time I'm going to show you how to use fabric that is ready for your copier that has a slick backing on the underside that can be copied right onto the fabric. Then you don't have to do reverse images, it just saves one step. You organize as many photos as possible onto an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. Then do a test run with the photocopy machine on a blank sheet of paper to see which side of the paper your photos will print on. That way you'll know which side of this fabric to put into your machine. I'm going to place the glossy side up, which I have already done on my machine, and then just hit copy, and I'll be ready to wait a few minutes to let that copy. While that's working, I'm going to explain a little bit about fabric. When we worked with the crazy piecing in the past, in the past two steps, we worked with scraps of fabric. But because of the interest of the snapshots, the added machine embroidery designs, we need fabric that doesn't take away from these elements. We chose four fabrics, four marbleized or model backgrounds that coordinated and cut them into about three inch strips and then cut some strips six to seven inches wide and the reason we cut them that wide was so that they could be placed in a machine embroidery hoop and the machine embroidery could be stitched into this area. And because this was a graduation, we chose springtime elements from a nature collection of embroidery designs. It worked very appropriately with the graduation theme. So you can see you're going to be using fabrics that are not so distinctive as the fabrics we had before. Again, you're going to be working with a background fabric, and we cut a 15-inch square using a 15-inch ruler, cut six of these. And Right now, the fabric has been transferred, or the photos have been transferred to the fabric. It just spit it out, so we can just take this from the copier. It's coming out. When it comes out, it's a little damp. So you can let this air dry, 
or since I'm in a hurry right now, I'm just going to cover it with a press cloth and speed the drying process with a dry iron. After it is dried, and make sure it is dry because you need to make it water or washable, and that is you run it under tap water. And you may find some coloring comes off. And then again, let it dry, and you may want to transfer again or use your iron to heat set it. But here you have the fit photos ready to be worked on. Now the paper or the glossy backing, and let's see if I can catch this with the corner of my fingernail, can just be peeled off. And then we can cut these shapes and start the crazy piecing process. I took time off camera to rinse the photo transfer and let it dry so it could be washed if you'd like later on and basted it to the center of the 15 inch square. By the way, I was trying to remove the paper film from the back or the film from the back. I just removed that and now it's ready to work with the strip quilting or the crazy quilting technique. I have one strip cut just a little bit longer than what I need. I'm going to align it next to one edge of the fabric and just as before, stitch straight. And here I'm going to sew just with a slightly narrower seam allowance because I don't want to get into Jessica's hand of the photo. And after stitching, I can clip the threads. And now I'm just going to finger press for you, pressing the seam allowance away from the picture, exposing the right side. Then with your long strip of fabric, kind of place it next to the fabric that you have on the foundation and cut another strip. You don't have to be very accurate. We just need to cover our bases, so to speak. And now I'll add the next strip. I think you get the idea. It's just the same concept as before. With photos, you can crop away the refrigerator or someone's back or some part of the picture that perhaps you didn't like in the snapshot. You can just create just the portion that you'd like to see. And I'll just add one more strip so that you can see the concept. The picture doesn't have to be framed exactly the way a picture would be framed in a, a mat. You're going, you can frame it with uneven edges. And here we go. And you keep working until you've filled in this 15 inch square. This quilt has six 15 inch squares. And we made certain that after they were all stitched and squared, they were all the same size so that they could be adjoined together very evenly. You can see how quickly this can be added. As you add additional sections, we talked about working with machine embroidery. I had you cut squares six to eight inches large so that you can do the embroidery. Then you could later cut these to size, cut them in smaller strips, save the excess fabric on the top or bottom to be used as part of the crazy piecing. And then this English ivy, which came from a nature's reflection card, can be added to the block itself and kind of adding a nice little element. As you can see, we have a ways to go on here. For the finishing details, I'd like to show you the border and one of the blocks. The block has two embroideries, one in the center and one in the side, and one in the lower edge, actually three embroideries, plus two po photos. Notice these little photos little small pictures of Jessica, just the right size to fit as part of the strip piece. The borders were six inches wide, so at each quarter, corner you'll find an updated picture of Jessica from her graduation photo. These are great ways of preserving memories. One final hint, make certain that you sign and date your project that you're creating or make a photo transfer. Here's a photo transfer of my great grandmother and the restoration information on in the back of the quilt. It's a great way to preserve memories. Bye for now. Visit Nancy's website at www.sewingwithnancy.com for more information on this program. Sewing with Nancy has been made possible by grants from the following companies. FOP, simply the best European line of sewing machines. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears. Madeira Threads, designed for home and professional embroiderers everywhere. Oxmoor House, publishers of sewing, quilting, and craft books. Prim Dritz, the source for sewing and quilting notions. Amazing designs by Great Notions, your complete source for machine embroidery. And Nancy's Notions Sewing Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and notions. <laughs>